it is. <clears throat> so I've put the recording on and we'll, we'll start. I think others may well join us. In fact, they're doing so even as we speak, which is great. So welcome to the AIN Big Topic monthly sessions. I'm Paul Z. Jackson, and this is the first Brain Tank session, which we're hoping will run through the year. Not every month, we'll intersperse it with book club meetings and maybe other things as well. And the idea of the Brain Tank is to explore what's the future of applied improvisation. So what is applied improvisation? Who are the people who are doing it? Where might it sit in academic departments if we had to place it somewhere academically? Does it belong to theatre or is it maybe <laughs> psychology or business studies or, or something else again? What research would we like to see done into applied improvisation if we were able to inspire researchers in the way that, for example, positive psychology has done so successfully? Um, and what's the ambition of practitioners of applied improvisation for applied improvisation in the world. What I hope we can do today is some scoping and some framework setting, get some of the ideas onto the table. We have a panel, a very distinguished guest panel, who I'll introduce in a moment. And at the same time, we're also inviting everyone who's participating to join in with the discussions in breakout rooms, which we'll do from time to time, and in plenary. And we're also going to aim to document the discussions that we have. So we're recording this, which is one form of document, but also written documentation. There's a Google Doc, which I will share with you if you didn't see it before. That is there. And as you have seen, Jeannie has already started supplementing the documentation with notes in chat. So we'll be able to save those and keep them too. And you're all invited to participate in both of those documents as well if you want to. So in the chat, just write anything you want as we go along, questions, comments, wise observations. And in the Google Doc, which is aiming to be a little bit more substantial perhaps than a chat, then you can put comments on the pieces that people write. I've written the first piece to get things started. And there's three or four people have commented on that, including both of the panelists. And there's an invitation for you, not just to comment on what other people write, but to write a piece yourself if you're inspired to do so. And I'll very briefly introduce the two panelists um, as Jeannie's already mentioned that there's something she might like to write. So one panelist is Jeannie Lambin. Hello, Jeannie. Do you want to say hello? Good morning, every good afternoon, morning, evening, wherever you are in the world. Uh, hello. Hello. And our other panelist is Kat Coppett. Kat, hello, everyone. Like to say hello. You did faster than I could introduce Sorry. you. I'm a New Yorker at heart. <laughs> Splendid. So Contributions welcome throughout, both written and spoken. And today we're going to look at what I'm calling the three waves, which we'll describe and discuss soon. And you can see a preview of that in the Google Doc if you open that up. It's uh, the topic of that first piece. But I'd like to start with a chat question for everybody, which is this. What is applied improvisation in your view? Um, for example, how would you describe it to yourself or to a potential client or an academic researcher or somebody who was wondering what is applied <laughs> improvisation? Mm. That's a, that's, a well barked answer. So far, yes. <laughs> Very astute. Put that in the chat. <laughs> we'll see what some of them have to say. More to my dog. Practical experiential application of social science research. Wow, a good hefty definition straight <laughs> in there from Nancy. <sighs> Applying improvisational meta skills to work life philosophical implications of meta skills. 
people having fun, practicing skills and learning new attitudes. Bogdan, Olivia, taking the skills and mindsets of onstage improv and applying them to offstage environments. That's quite similar to the definition that the Applied Improvisation Network has been using for around 20 years. But certainly not the last word in it. Spontaneous action guided by intuition. And what Livia said, <laughs> an upvote. Okay, so keep putting those ideas in there. And I'm gonna invite Jeannie and uh, Kat to say what their definitions are. They may have written them there, but maybe to expand on them a little bit or how you would describe it to yourself or to clients or to academic researchers. Does it change if you describe it to different people? Uh, Jeannie, do you want to go first? Um, sure, I will go first. So I would, I think improv, applied improvisation is taking the improvisational mindset, which is a beautiful quirk of human evolution, and then taking that mindset and putting it out into the world intentionally in a range of applications. And those can be academic contests, those can, or contests, absolutely. Academia is often a contest. Um, academic contexts, um, you know, social justice um, in uh, training and facilitation. So, and with that, I think that there's a degree of intentionality. So one of the things for me that makes improv applied is the direct intention to, or have the ability to respond in that way to a situation. Okay. And that's not you. a super succinct definition. It doesn't need to be at this point. I, mean, I don't think there's any specific particular merit in a definition. If we're going to have a range of them and different descriptions, perhaps, for different contexts. Katz, what's your definition or description of yeah. applied improvisation? Yeah, I, I mean, I think we're sort of, we, we've sort of, you know, when I said what Livia said, I, I think that's a, a good succinct um, definition that we are, the, at least the way it grew up, is that we are taking the tools and exercises and mindsets of improvisational theater and applying them to contexts other than uh, creating shows and performances on stage for an audience. Uh, what what I love about sort of what we're doing now is I remember you and I, Paul, having a conversation once where we realized, well, maybe uh, it's the other way around. Maybe performance improv is just another application. Maybe it's just a subset of applied improvisation where we're taking those tools and mindsets and applying it to performance instead of applying it to having a good conversation or to uh, generating creative ideas. Um, but yeah. yeah, I think that's yeah. how I talk about it. And, and yeah, I'll well, stop there for now, yeah. Okay, um, I, so I remember those conversations and I think in the end, that's where it would be nice to end up where there's improvisation, whatever that is, and it's applied to all sorts of contexts and arenas, including theater, yeah. comedy, jazz, coaching, management, and cooking. <laughs> sports yeah. yeah wherever life in right. its complexity arises yeah. and that the difficulty of getting to that is that we're so familiar with it most of us at least in a theater context which in, as i put in the article has become very much a thing a product and well known for that and so it's obscured this actually much larger area where well, improvisation occurs well i know i mean there's something else in there paul that you're talking about which is, uh, you know, this this concept that we are we say very sort of casually, or at least we say it. Some of us say, you know, we're improvising all the time, um, and now we're just going to do it deliberately or do it consciously. But I'm not really sure that's true. I think most of the time we're not improvising. Most of the time we're sort of following these habitual scripts and ways of doing things that are pretty reified and pretty, pretty scripted. You know, I drive the same way to work. I have the same conversation with my mother every single time. You know, my, my husband annoys me in a certain way and then I respond in a certain way and he responds to me and they were like, how are we having this conversation again, right? And we get stuck. 
and I so I think there's a way that, um, as Jeannie says, being deliberately applying these rules of improvisation can help us break open some things and get out of some patterns, get unstuck. Uh, it, maybe that's the end of that sentence. Yes, in a sense, there's no point in saying we're improvising all the time because then there's nothing to contrast it with yeah. or relating everything to one particular metaphor. Yeah. So uh, you can also take a, a fractal view where within any circumstance, we can focus in further on it and see, even if it's a scripted event, that there could be improvisation happening within a scripted thing. So actors, for example, with a script performing a show, they make it fresh each time through right. responding newly to the specific things that are happening on that occasion with that audience, with how a line is offered to them. So it's not necessarily even yeah. an either or. Yeah. Do you need you wanted to? You yeah, like well, two thoughts saying. come to mind is that one, um, Gil Fran Franisdal, um, I think I'm, I'm not sure if I'm saying his name correctly, but he um, is at the Insight Meditation Center and he describes meditation as an observation deck for the brain. And I love that as a description for improv, because I think it's this great way to kind of see this amazing tool that we have and play with what is possible because of it. And it, then that leads me to patterns, because I think those same patterns we can kind of fall into, like the well-rutted wagon tracks of you know thought are the same things that make it possible to improvise and see new patterns and make connections and bring things back. So it's this, this duality of mindset where on the one hand it's how we behave every day and then I like the the term deliberate cat as a way to kind of then um, turn that so that it's not so you're putting the pattern on a new context yeah thank you those are a few starter thoughts and I'm going to invite everyone to join a breakout room with four or five people in your room and have a look at this as a question. The definitions that you came up with or the ones that you liked, that you read, what do these different descriptions have in common? And what are some of the significant differences between one and another? And as you have your conversation and build on each other's ideas in a time-honored improvisational way, what might be worth adding if we begin to extend those descriptions or definitions? So can we come up with a, a more rounded, thorough, interesting, different, exciting description of what this applied improvisation is? You'll get an invitation to a room. And if you accept the invitation, you'll be beamed into the room. I'm sure you're all Zoom veterans after a, a year of doing this. So if anyone is left behind or not sure what to do, I'll be here for a moment to guide that. And then I will join one of the rooms and let's have a um, 10 minute conversation. See where that takes us. And we'll meet back together in 10 minutes time. Paul, before we get sent away, is there somewhere where we would like people to capture their um, Excellent point. definitions? Yes. So in line with what I was saying earlier about chat, if you chat within the private room, within the breakout room, that remains private to you, but you can cut and paste it and then bring it back to the plenary. So that would be a really good thing to do because that will help us with the documentation. But we'll take spontaneous additions when we return as well. So here come the invitations. See you in 15, 10 minutes. Colin, not clear how to use Zoom rooms. Welcome back. Hope you had good conversations <laughs> and we'd like to hear what you said or what you wrote or both. I always have the impression of the change back to the main room as being the old um, vaudeville stage hook. You were there and then, whoosh, you know, even though we see it coming, it's... <laughs> it's like magic. 
Yes. <laughs> I find Zooms be like magic even now after a year of sitting with it. Simo asks, is the world ready for the definition of AI? Well, we think it might be ready to start hearing at least some descriptions, maybe rather even than definitions. So let's start with that room that had Nancy, Robert, Livia and Amy. And I'm starting there because Nancy has put in some of the chat that was created in that room. Do you want to elaborate on that, Nancy, or anyone else who was in that room? Sure. Liv, have my, Livia, have my back here as I... Um... No clear definition, but one of my favorite things in the world is talking to fellow <laughs> creatives as we explore both the uh, the creative consciousness and cognition. We talked about it being um, we talked about an intuition being a part of our knowing that rarely sees the light of day and that has a wonderful way of showing up on in improv uh we talked about um paul added that you know we all have it as humans indeed adaptation is what humans do um it's play and creativity it's about but however ai is about creating those aha moments that allow one to have a conscious appreciation for what just happened, you know, and experiencing their um, delight and it being a revelatory experience. Um, Livia talked about how it increases our agency and, and we appreciated, uh, how did Jeannie say at the beginning, well rutted wagon tracks of thought and action, you know, that, you know, we, we appreciated Kat's comment about, you know, maybe we don't improvise all the time, we get into, you know, we are deeply um, siloed and, and habitual in our, in our actions. So improv takes us out of that, uh, out of the ruts, or at least, at, at least allows us to see them. What else, Livia? What did I? I, I think you did a, a lovely Robert. job. <laughs> oh, and we love Venn diagrams too. Yes, yes. We, were, we were trying to put. <laughs> there are diagrams on the way to turn this into a proper white paper or think piece that can go out to the to the journals. Uh, so Simo and has put something in the chat as well. So let's go to Simo's group, which was Simo, Matt, Kat and Colin. Have you more things to put in the chat or things to talk to us about? It's Kat's group. Collins group. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I, th I uh, so um, I think it's just I, I the, the the general kind of conversation came around of are, are we are we all are we all talking about the same thing? Are we putting labels on things that are actually now creating barriers? And so therefore, just by using one word, are we creating a barrier, particularly when people know it from a certain perspective? Um, so it becomes this thing, but actually um, it's maybe it's just a set of ingredients. Uh, and so there, the question I then put in the chat was, well, are, are we being just recipe followers or are we being chefs? So it's, it's an interesting one to think, well, I know we're trying to label things, but is it serving us rather than thinking, well, what can we, can we kind of get some granularity to this rather than going, oh, it's this, this is what it is, rather. And so just break it down. Um, again, I, you probably, the, the way I, I think about it and talk to other people is talking about co-creation, uh, collaboration, communication, and trust. That's just the way I've found by encountering it, the way to communicate the, the layers. So it's just an interesting one of what, what, are, we, what are we describing? If Which we is, can't even have a joined up view, how do we expect it to communicate to other people? Hmm. What well, was one of the questions that's prompted this gathering is 
how do we use the words? Are these the words to use? Simo will now answer the question definitively. I'm, I'm just thinking, the con like based on what I'm doing with my clients, uh, it seems like improv uh, improvisation is one of the tools or improvisational mindset or impro meta skills or whatever you like to call them they are one area of tools that i use but there are also other areas that like you know there are, there are lots of t other toolkits that i use so i'm kind of not calling myself an applied improviser you know towards the clients i'm i'm a trainer facilitator or uh like I like to call myself interaction designer. So I'm kind of designing a different communication situations for my clients, like helping them to design them to work well. So, um, and I use improvisation as a mindset, as a trainer, and also as one of the toolkits. But I can't say that all I'm, that it is all I'm doing. I'm not you know, if I face my clients, I'm not saying that I'm an applied improviser. I'm doing applied improvisation with you. That's one of the tools I use. Yes, I, I'm sure within the network, there's a, a real range of what we say we're doing, particularly in relation to mentioning the improvisation word or the improv word, which was the start of the article in the Google Doc is the associations people already have with some of these words. And I use the word improvisation with the client, with clients, uh, um, but all, only as a one tool. So this it's, it's on the plate that the mm. improvisation is a very important offering also, but it's only one of, one of them. Thanks, Simo. And the other group, right, Sue, Eleanor, Jeannie, and Nick. Things to add in chat or in plenary discussion. Uh, I, I'm, you know, I think that we, I think these conversations loop and sometimes I'm interested in, um, I think we have a lot of conversations within the applied improv network and my guess is outside of it as well that are false dichotomies. It's interesting to me how often we as improvisers um, get hooked by either or conversations and, um, you know, like, uh, you know, failure conversations or yes and conversations or this one about is, you know, is it, should we call ourselves applied improvisers or not? And I think um, sometimes <laughs> we should talk explicitly about improv and the value of applied improv of, of improvisation. And sometimes we should not. And I think the, the, the question, as, I, as we often say to our clients, is uh, it's the right question to ask. I don't think there's always the right, one right answer to that question, but it's a really good, important question to ask. When, am, when is it valuable to explicitly reference improvisation or improvisational theater as a tool or that that's where the tool is coming from or as a, uh, I'm avoiding the word metaphor, but as a sort of example or image or touchstone or touch point explicitly, what's the value of that? And when is it not? When is that a distraction or a barrier? And I think there are really clear situations where both where one or the other is true. We might not all agree on exactly each situation, but I think that's a question we should always be asking ourselves as consultants and trainers and coaches. Thank you, Kat. Robert, and then, right, so I've invited you to share a screen. I, I go back to, to my very basic, my first Im applied improvisation workshop that I set out to get, calling on all the businesses in Atlanta two responses that sat there. One, 
of course, now this goes way back. And, and one of the responses was, hi, I'm Robert Lloyd, got a team building pro uh, uh, program called Team Building with Improvisation. I'd like you to send to uh, a couple of people. Ah, not here, click. And another who was Dr. Ed Metcalf, who was the senior trainer for IBM Corporation. I'm Robert Lloyd, team building with Improvisation. Uh, I'd like you to send out, send two people. What? Uh, yeah, well, yes, so here's in the details. He says, you wanna know why I said yes so quickly? Well, yes, sir. He said, do you know the meaning of the term enthusiasm? Well, no, sir, I, you know, I don't know where it comes from. It's etymology. And within theos, God, expression of the God within, he says, I don't know who you are. I don't know what you've got, but you've got enthusiasm and I want my people to get it. <laughs> so that's my bottom line. It has been my bottom line forever. And my other bottom line is that we don't know who we're dealing with until the day that we get there. Whatever we think, we do not know who we're dealing with until the gathering has been made. And our first job is to understand that as much as we can. Can they handle the language? Are they a no thanks? Are they a, hey, wonderful world? And then we can begin as Simo says, there's so many different ways we can describe this, what we're planning on doing. What we're going to do is what happens when we arrive. <laughs> And that's my baseline for all of this. So as far as the title, general overall, wonderful. I tell people, hey, you know, you know improv comedy, right? Yeah, still people, yeah. Have you, know, have you heard about applied improvisation? What's that? So that's yes. always the conversation. Thank, thank you, Robert. I'd, I'd like to make the point for the, the, this brain tank that it's not just the question of when and what we say to clients or converse with clients there's there is this thing called applied improvisation that it's of interest to us as a as a community and that there's all sorts of things that we might say about it or might choose not to say about it at different times so bright sue and eleanor were both interested to come in bright sue first then eleanor uh okay i can just share a document and just a picture i just draw a moment ago and i can give a, a overload of my understanding, improv, Zen, Tao, or intuition, something like that. And then I draw a comparison between improv and Zen and the current and the past 30 years uh, situation. Like it, it, my understanding are very personal, like improv is equal to Zen, Tao, or intuition, or spontane spontaneity. Uh, improv and people has a misunderstanding is only common because in the past 30 years and it has a movement, a whose line, serious sports, common sports, it's a very narrow kind of understanding and but it has very deep cultural impact in a lot of people. They learn improv through this comedy approach. Of course, now we know also we have the legitimate theater of improv and doing long form or like Impro LA doing a wonderful, wonderful yeah. different uh, genres out there. And Impro, John Stonier has a important part in that. And of course we know this is all about theater and we know AI has much more application in other areas. From here, I draw a comparison to Zen and a lot of people learn Zen through mindfulness, through two major movements. MBSR Cobazine movement and or the UK version MBCT uh, started in 1990s. And, and this kind of approach also has its limitation. And one interesting word is Mac mindfulness, a little bit like Big Mac, <laughs> McDonald's, something like that. So like, you know, a lot of companies now using mindfulness to enhance their productivity, but they don't value the diversity or the respect. They just want people work, work, work more using a tool of mindfulness, which is not good. Or people talking about killing a cow mindfully without pain, and that's totally wrong. And of course, we know that is much more and compassion, similar, and etc. like that. And and I will start right here. Thank you very much. Um, we'll return to some of the, these perceptions in a moment when we talk about the three waves. Before we do that, Elena, was there something that you did to add? 
Uh, thank you. Yeah, I was just wanting to add to what Kat said about that, how much context matters and, and when we use certain words and terms and both, I would say, for talking to clients, but also um, uh, in defining what we do to ourselves and to the community. Uh, I feel that um, that it sometimes does really help and sometimes it doesn't help to use the wording that are very familiar to us, but not very familiar to people who have never experienced it and then have all sorts of assumptions and create their own idea of what we will do or what, what's happening and, and what kind of prerequisites people should bring, which we always try to emphasize, like all you need to do is show up and everything else we do together. Uh, and you don't need to be a certain personality to you make use of the principles of applied improvisation. But that sometimes is, once people start to have their own assumptions about what improvisation is about, it's really hard to bring them back to like play zero or like start like corner one or whatever you call it, and then just be open-minded with it. And my other experience is that uh, it's sometimes a lot easier to do something than to talk about it and explain what improv is and like, okay, no, it's like this, no, it's not like that. And then people are getting confused. And so often what we do is, and particularly when, either when talking to friends or with people, or even in a call with a client, before, like in a first setting up something call, it's just like, let's do something. And then you experience like a show don't tell. And that to me is much more helpful than, than talking about it and trying to get on the same plate and not being sure whether you ever get there. There are certainly things that can only be experienced and not, not known by reading about them. You can read about riding bicycles and it doesn't give you the experience of riding a bicycle and improvisation is in that category somehow. But I'd like to say a few things about the three waves to give a, a sense of a possible, um, possible ways of thinking about what it is we're doing as the applied improvisation network or as applied improvisers. And certainly it seems to have some resonance with what Bright Sue was sharing about how improvisation has been perceived. And um, I've, this is what I've written about in the Google Docs. So some of you I know have read that and started commenting on it. Very grateful for that. And I know Jeannie might write about wave zero, which precedes the wave one that I'm describing. I'm not gonna say everything that's in the article because you can read that, but a couple of additional comments. The wave one, which is the practice of improv comedy or improv theater and the possibility that some people get more from that than things that are useful for the theater so they notice that it's good for their life in some way or other uh, it prompts their confidence or their creativity or gives them some ideas that they may take outside but the primary purpose within wave one is you do improvisation theatre, you go on the stage with it, or you choose not to go on the stage with it. And my additional comment is that I think is still the dominant and main wave that is out there in the world. So it's what all the improvisation theatres do when they're training people to be improvisers. And that's probably what happens more than anything else and is often many people's roots into improvisation. And wave two happens when the people who've noticed that there's all these other benefits or byproducts or other good things that happen when people improvise theatrically start to make that the topic of what they are then teaching, usually still in the form of workshops and courses. But the courses are now called confidence or creativity or teamwork. And we see all these words appearing as typical of wave two, where the focus is not on doing improvisation on stage or even necessarily using the stage activities and range of concepts. And there's a sort of two branches of that. There's a branch where you're still doing theatrical things, but saying as well as that, you could see these applying elsewhere. And I think that's where some of the big corporate improvisation performing companies have gone. So Second City, you know of them because of their comedic and theatrical and televisual expressions, but you'll go there to learn these other things because they've got the credibility, but they'll still teach you within the fairly traditional theatrical based format. Or there's the other branch within that, which I think is more what I do where 
I'm not necessarily telling people that it's improvisation, though I might be, to go back to the discussion we had before. And there's no theatre in what I'm teaching at all, it's sort of detached from that. And um, I'm no longer working with theatre, even though that was where I first worked with improvisation. And both of those branches of wave two are, I think, around with us now, both healthy and both have lots more possibilities in them. And then there's wave three, which is less formulated, certainly in my conception of it, but is maybe the most exciting and has the most potential, which is improvisation is this thing in and of itself that we can experience, apply, talk about, characterize, conceptualize, and experience in all sorts of forms and make that conscious and coherent too. And my, my favorite example of that as a product or service is uh, Jeannie's quest, where there's some workshopping does happen, but that's not really the essence of it. The essence of the quest is where you go out on your own, usually, or maybe with somebody else if you choose to, and you have a deliberately improvisational experience in the world, and that is the thing. And then you might reflect and share and talk about that too, in order to get a coherent view of it. So th those, I think, are three distinctive enough waves, and that we're all operating somewhere in a tradition of one or more of those waves. And I'm going to put a question in the chat and invite you into some rooms to see what you make of that. So the questions are, where did you come in as in your entrance to improvisation? Was it a theatrical entrance or an organisational entrance or research or, or something else? What's the potential for applied improvisation if each of those waves continues to develop and express itself? And where do you see yourself being in the mix? ideally, perhaps in relation to where you are now. Not expecting you to answer all those questions. They're prompt questions that might be interesting for your discussion. If there's something else that's more striking to you or more important to talk about, then by all means do that. And then we'll share some findings um, before we wrap up shortly after the hour, maybe between the hour and 15 past for today's session. So let's have another 10 minutes in groups. I've refreshed the groups so you can meet some different people. Here come your invitations. Welcome back. What did you talk about? Particularly interested if it was about the potential or where you see yourself with this thing called applied improvisation. Simo has put a document in. What, what have you put in there, Simo? Oh, I found the schema. Uh, Giovanni Schiuma is a scholar who has researched art-based methods and their use in organizations. And, and this nine grade version, it's not what I use. I've, I've done my own version in Finnish that's more about applied improvisation, but the, but the basic idea of the nine grade is that that if you are working at second or third wave, there's also the application areas that, that are uh, more common or more rare. And um, um, uh, one of the most uh, usable applications are like entertainment, like in the end of seminar day, we are doing the values improvisation, we are displaying the values in, in scenes and we are displaying things, we are kind of using improvisation to display information, uh, like in an entertainment kind of uh, purpose. And, and also there are like trainings like who, who are trained like you can train impro skills communication skills and you can do deep team building customer service and that's 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 the next level of like that's very common and then and then if you think of like leadership skills and 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 blah 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 they are skill sets and blah 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 but i think that if you think of the right top that that's transfer like cultural transformation that's that's totally uh you know that's more, totally more ambitious more out there but 
It's possible. Yeah, but, but I've done projects with, with organizations yeah. using Absolutely. improvisation uh, as a tool for organizational change. So, yeah. so it's, I think many of you have done it, but I think this is a lovely nine grade because it, it shows us uh, that there are also lots of ways to apply whatever our definition of apply, <laughs> applied improvisation is, or some people say art-based methods. Yeah, I don't. Um, but I do include the humanitarian work, some of that that um, AIN and AIN members have done. Um, Belina's idea of using improvisation to change the world. And uh, Robert was talking about being a walk-up comedian. He does improvisation, improvises with people in the community as he walks around with them. I definitely want to bring in Kat and Jeannie, because Kat wrote that she came from theatre and then studied management and organisations. And Jeannie said she leapt from step one, uh, wave one to wave three. So maybe you could say a little bit each about that and then see what other people would like to comment on. Kat? Sure. Um, yeah, so I went from traditional theatre conservatory, acting conservatory, uh, to improvisation because to become a better actor, actually. And there was a real split in New York City between traditional theater and improv. Um, you know, improv was not respected at all. But I was in a theater company and someone came to do an improv workshop because they had some connection. And uh, the, the improv, improv teacher said, you, you're good at this because I was following her directions. I was a good student, right? I wasn't funny or anything. Uh, and she was able to say to me, she was able to make sense to me to give me a positive path towards saying what my acting teachers were unable to say in a positive way. They would say, don't think, or you're too smart to be an actor. All of these ways of trying to get me to not censor myself, right? Or not hyper intellectualize. And she was able to say things like, yes and, or be spontaneous, or give me exercises rather than just talk to me about what I shouldn't be doing. Um, so that's how I found improv. And then cut to three or four years later, my students started to say, oh, I wish my boss knew about this yes and thing, or I wish my team could collaborate and support ourselves the way my classmates do. And they brought me into organizations to start teaching, I guess, wave two right in their organizations and i was like okay i'm a starving actor you have money I'll very do attractive it. prospect right but i i really felt at some level uncomfortable about it i was like i don't want to be selling snake oil what do i know about organizational development i don't know that this is useful so i went back and got a master's in organizational psychology and that's a longer story but very quickly i was like oh there are things that i take for granted coming from a world of theater coming from a world of improvisation that people are starving for, right? There's something that people just don't get. So of course we're a value. I'll go one more step and then I'll hand it to Jeannie that it then took me a whole other couple of years out in the world um, of my clients saying it to me over and over again for me really to get um, the ways in which what we were doing, and I guess this is the wave three revelation that it wasn't a metaphor. <laughs> Right, that, that when we said, you know, like improvisation, that we weren't, it wasn't a metaphor. We were saying like, what you need to do, the things you need to do in life to collaborate better, to communicate better, to listen more, to be more present, to make your partner look good are exactly the things you have to do off stage. And what we were talking about in our group was, um, there are many, many different paths to that. Meditation and mindfulness, um, you know, there are all sorts of ways to get to that. What it makes improvisational theater unique or special or especially good, I think, is that it's like this giant gym full of exercise equipment. We have collectively built just a lot, a lot and a lot, a lot, a lot of exercises to help build those muscles in different ways. We have a, a very rich activity basket. <laughs> Right. Very rich. Right. So people talk uh, about all of those muscles or mindsets that they want to develop. We've got something for that. We've got things that will get yeah. you there. Yeah. We'll, we'll come in future sessions maybe to how some of those are, are better or not so well used. 
but I think it's a really nice set of points and how I, I've just written in the chat that theatre is often a metaphor. It's like we're on stage, even though we're not. But improvisation is the actual thing. And that's a really good distinction. Jeannie, you're muted. I love hearing everybody's origin stories. So I was uh, in high school, I had an audition like Livia. Um, I don't know if yours, but we, we have a similar kind of impetus in that I auditioned for a play and didn't get cast. And I was kind of crushed in the way that you can only be crushed when you're 16. And so I got out the yellow pages and started calling, you know, different improv schools because I was going to show them. And um, Second City told me I would have to take teen classes, which I thought I'd rather kind of eat glass than do that. And um, I called IO and I actually talked to Sharna and she said, well, come in and try it and you can see how it works. And so I went in and when I was at IO, um, it was like it was before improv became a commodity in the way that it became in Chicago. And it was um, it was just a much different thing. And so now I look back and I don't know how I was courageous enough to be like 16 years old with a bunch of, you know, adults um, doing improv, but there you have it. And then I decided that if I wanted to represent human experience, it was a much better thing to do to get more experience. And so I studied anthropology and archeology span and then went into historic preservation. I kind of left, um, you know, I went into improv because I thought it would teach me to be funny. But what I discovered there was that it taught me how to live. Um, and when I went into my work, um, I would kind of, you know, I was presenting at a conference. I'm like, well, let's do a play instead of a panel discussion. Of course, you're all going to wear giant photo murals on your head where you're going to represent different works of modern architecture and compete in a bachelorette like, uh, you know, competition. And I just kind of, leapt into these things and then when I discovered kind of the applied improv network I was like oh right this is what I've been doing now I have a name for it and um and then when I encountered the quest um I became fascinated um by it as a way to you know what is this improvisational mindset and then how do you break apart the components of the improvisational mindset and what does it mean to take that out into the world, not just for like a few hours, but for a few days, a few months, an entire life. And then kind of digging more into the roots of improv and latching onto its roots as what I see in you know, Chicago and North America as a tool for social change and really wanting to like, what would it look like if we all had this resilient, spontaneous, wonderful self to access and what magic and good could we bring into our own lives and the lives of others on a small scale, but then also on a global scale. Thank you, Jeannie. Um, there are roots before it became improv as a commodity and, and they are in social change and it's in some ways come back full circle through the AIN and other, other activists. Well, a few minutes to go. Um, what else would anyone like to say, either in chat or in verbal communication with the whole group? Amy, and hello, Suzanne. I was really um, delighted with what I heard at the beginning of the conversation when, I don't know, if it was the kind of going back and forth between what Kat and Jeannie said about we say, oh, we're improvising all the time. And that phrase never sat well with me. I didn't understand why until now. No, we're not. We're just, we're in automatic mode most of the time because it's just easier. And that um, what Jeannie said about that we had to do this with uh, deliberately, uh, consciously at times. So I think you had a different word, Jeannie. And that just was really satisfying to me. I'm like, yeah, and that's why it can sometimes feel scary or hard or effortful for people at times because they've got to get out of the automatic brain mm. and do make different choices so that just uh i'm just thank you for that insight and that connection thank you amy right to uh, we talk a lot about comedy but also i want to give the credit to the comedy as well and 
about exposure about it, uh, improv and like who's right is anyway and it give exposure to millions of people and I meet a lot of people who actually got to know improv through who's right anyway and the theater can reach hundreds hundred people but workshop can reach only dozens of people and very limited in terms of scale so who's not still has this value in out there. The more people we can get them interested in, in improv and the better chance we can get them deep more into the improv. Okay. Yeah. Uh, many of our roots are from there. And I, I love theater, improvisational comedy, long form improvisation. And at the same time, I think it can be distinguished conceptually and usefully from improvisation in some other applications. So both and, not an either or. <laughs> Let's go back earlier to our conversation. Right. Were people waving there? Yeah. Je was... Jeannie and Robert, Robert then Jeannie. Very quickly um, on the idea of we always are improvising. I grew up in a ghettoized gang run neighborhood in the 1950s in Southern California and didn't know until maybe two years ago that I was improvising in order to get there, I had to be aware of everything around me, not knowing what to expect from a given moment. And the improv has brought that back. And I also respect what people are saying, because it's so easy to get into the ruts, into the, the, the wagon wheel ruts. I love that term. Something about consciousness, being more alive, responsive to circumstance in different ways, adapting to change. These are, these are certainly things we'll be talking about. Jeannie. Um, this was just something that occurred in reading um, some of the comments and talking about rules and kind of learning. And um, one thing is, is that I like building blocks as a term rather than rules, because it, it also uh, speaks to the assembly like nature of what the different ways we express um, improvisation. But then also it makes me think about uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning in that, you know, there's there's this information that comes in and then it creates rules and then those rules then learn and then it goes on. And, you know, I am by, uh, as anyone listening to it would know, not an expert in machine learning, but play can be a very deliberate tool for helping machines learn. And I think we're at this fascinating thing where we're, we're both, um, I, I don't know, I think that these, these two fascinating ways of externalizing our thought and putting it out into the world are kind of coming together at this really interesting intersection. Thank you for raising the other AI. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> They'll continue in some parallel. So we, we'll finish in a moment, but there's an invitation that we also continue with more meetings of the brain tank. That's the B-R-A-I-N tank, which will be, thank you very much. <laughs> which will be here in a month's time. It's the first, no, it's the second something of the month. Second Tuesday of the month is when the big topics are happening. And they'll be notified in the AIN newsletters on the Facebook page and in the LinkedIn page. So you'll, you'll see them there. Thank you so much for coming. And there's also an invitation to keep writing. We've got one Google Doc so far, but we can obviously extend that to sections and chapters if the writing explodes in a way that it might and we'll find a way to think about how to incorporate the chat from the session itself into the documentation too so that we get a sort of rich depth to the discussion and we can read back on what we've already created and then take it on further month by month and see what we make of applied improvisation in the world so thank you all very much indeed for being here this time and we'll see you again, no doubt, soon. What a wonderful gathering. Thank you so much. I'll stop the recording. Thank you.